went on to speak about illuminating process theorem. Uh, this is the textbook of the future. Uh, and this is also the informal uh, master summary. Uh, it's not a f master theorem does not need a defense, official defense, but it's an informal defense. And uh, we're going to combine the dinner in honor of uh, David and uh, next uh, week's speaker, uh, Eddie. And we go to a restaurant next week honoring both David and Eddie. And I hope you join us next week. Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. And thank you, Dr. C, for asking me to speak. Uh, like it was just said, this is an informal kind of master's defense. I just want to give you an idea of what I did for my master's. Um, unlike Emily and Baxter's great talks the last two weeks, there's not going to be kind of lots of groundbreaking new research, but uh, hopefully it'll be interesting. So this all stems from a reading course that I did with Dr. Z starting in the fall, um, and we decided to look at Roth's theorem, and the idea was for me to, to really understand what was going on. So. Uh, Okay, so what was the idea behind the project? Um, I guess it all stemmed from a question of how do we read mathematical papers? When we get a mathematical paper, how, how do we go about reading mathematical paper? How much do we understand? So how deep do we read it? Um, it's very easy when you get a mathematical paper to skip over a load of details. You, you're reading it and the author mentions a result and you just take that, okay, the author believes it, that's fine, and you skip over. And most of the time, hopefully, the author is correct, and you can just ignore all the details. But sometimes it kind of masks what's really going on underneath the proof. So why pick Roth's theorem? Um, to start, it's really one of the most kind of influential results in arithmetic combinatorics. Uh, I'll talk about what Roth's theorem is in a moment. But it really kind of launched a whole kind of route into things like Samaretti's theorem, things like the Green Tau theorem, and, and different generalizations. It's also a beautiful result. It's very simple to state, um, but at the same time, it's deceptively kind of complex, and there's a lot going on underneath kind of the background. So the whole idea was to take this simple statement and make everything going on in the background also simple and also understandable. <coughs> so, Ross theorem was um, proven in a paper called Uncertain Sets of Integers. And the paper is around about 55 years old. It was published in the London Journal of Mathematics in 1954. And it's really short. It's just under five pages. And you can find it on Google Scholar or or JSTOR, or things like that, and it's really brief. Roth kind of skims over most of the details and gives you a, almost a sketch of the proof. Um, so he proves this theorem that came to be known as Roth theorem. So what is Roth theorem? Roth theorem states that if a of x is the size of the largest subset of 1 to x, which does not contain any three-term arithmetic progressions, then a of x over x is bigger of 1 over log of x. So what does this mean? Well, hopefully you know what a three-term arithmetic progression is. That's just three numbers with constant difference between the two of them, between any two consecutive terms. So just something of the form a, a plus d, and a plus 2d. And we look at this set of integers from 1 up to x, and we look for sets that don't contain any such sequence. Uh, so it's fairly simple. There's nothing too complex going on there. Roth originally proved that uh, the density, so ax is the largest such set, and ax over x is the density of the largest sub such set. He originally just proved that this was decreasing towards 0. And in his paper on certain sets of integers, he then improved this bound to be of order 1 over log log x. And this is generally what people consider to be Roth's theorem. What was my aim, as I mentioned before? It was to make this, it was to make it completely transparent. So I wanted to 
make all of these statements that Roth just kind of skips over or he claims is just obvious. I wanted to make them all fully explained. And this was all going to be kind of my own original work, although it's probably all in the literature there somewhere, I was going to prove them myself to kind of improve my mathematical maturity, I guess, and to have them all collected in one, in one place. I also wanted the paper to be completely self-contained. I didn't want you have to look up definitions in different textbooks. I didn't want you to have to look up kind of some random theorem from Calc 1 that everybody's forgotten. <laughs> uh, at one point, there's a Jordan's inequality, which I knew I had seen a proof of at some point, but I couldn't remember it. So things like that I wanted to prove out so that you didn't need any external sources. And pretty soon, the six-page proof became 50 pages. And in about 50 pages, I go through the entire proof and explain every single step. At least I hope I have explained every single step. And the only thing that you need to understand the paper is pretty much the basic understanding of calculus. Um, hopefully, a advanced undergraduate will be able to read it and understand every step. Um, there's a lot of integrals are used within uh, Roth's method, he uses the Hardy-Littlewood method, which involves these circle integrals. But I don't actually think, going through the proof, you actually need to integrate anything. So you need to know the bound on an integral about the maximum value and the length of the interval, but you don't actually even need to know to, how to integrate to understand this paper. So to give you a simple example of what I mean by the expansion of these statements, in Roth's paper, he mentions um, he defines an exponential sum, which is just called S in the paper, and it, it's to do with the Hardy-Littlewood method, and it's um, kind of a generalization on a discrete Fourier transform. But in defining this sum, Roth just briefly mentions that for any real, real number alpha and any integer m, there exists an h and q integers and a real number beta, such that alpha equals h over q plus beta, where h over q are co-prime, q is less than or equal to m, and q times the absolute value of beta is less than or equal to 1 over m. And he mentions this in one sentence with no explanation. And when I saw it, I was like, that's not immediately obvious why that's true. And I learned that this was the Dirichlet box principle. And I had never seen, or at least I couldn't recall seeing the Dirichlet box principle before. So I decided to, OK. Let's work out how to prove this. And in actual fact, the Dirichlet box principle is a pretty simple application of the pigeonhole principle. So the pigeonhole principle is the idea that if you have n pigeons and n minus 1 boxes, then you have to, if you put all the pigeons in a box, then you have to have one box with at least two pigeons. So the pigeonhole principle is very simple, very simple to state. How do we apply it here? Well, our pigeons, in this case, are the non-integer parts of i times alpha, where i ranges from 0 to m. So we just take this number alpha that we're wanting to split up as a fraction plus this remainder, and we just multiply it by successive integers from 0 to m, and we have m plus 1 numbers, or pigeons. And all of these, because they're non-integer parts, are going to lie in the interval 0, 1. So we take this interval, 0, 1, and we split it into subintervals. And the subintervals have length, m, and we split it up into exactly m subintervals. These are our boxes. And because of the pigeonhole principle, we have m plus 1 numbers, m intervals, so any two numbers. So there must be two numbers, sorry, that lie in the same interval. And we just say that those numbers correspond to the integers k and j. It's then actually pretty simple. We just set q, which is our denominator of our fraction, to be the difference of these two numbers. We set h to be the difference of the floor of k times alpha and the floor of j times alpha. And we set beta to be the <coughs> remainder. And it's fairly simple to check that these satisfy the conditions that we require. But this is all masked in Roth's paper in one sentence. He just states, for any alpha and m, there exists hq beta such that this happens, 
and then goes on to define the sum. So this is a simple example of the, the kind of stuff that I wanted to illuminate. Let's talk about the uh, title. So I'm going to show you um, later on some more examples of, of where I've kind of expanded on Roth's paper. But I also looked at some alternative proofs of Roth. So um, the asymptotic we gave before, which I will actually write it because it's pretty important. We have this function a of x, which was defined before to be the largest subset of 1 to x that avoids three term arithmetic regressions. And Roth proved that this was of order 1 over log log x. So, one of the obvious questions to ask is can this be improved? And Borgan in 1999 proved what I believe is the best asymptotic to date, which is a of x over x is of order square root of log log x over log x. And it's quite a nice proof. It's, I went through the paper and I provided a, a summary in my master's thesis, but I definitely didn't go into anywhere near as much detail as Roth. <laughs> um, I mean, Roth's paper went from six pages to 50. This paper started at about 20 pages, and if I expand it, I dread to think how long it would get. So, Borgang gave the best asymptotic to date. Um, what about improving the proof? So you've obviously got this idea in maths of mathematical beauty and kind of what constitutes a good proof. Um, I looked at a proof by Crute and Sizas in 2009, which is really neat. Um, again, it's short. I think this is only about eight pages long. And it uses a very similar method to Roth, but where Roth involves a lot of integration, Crute and Sizek switch over into finite fields, and everything becomes discrete. And it's, it's really quite neat. Um, again, I gave a summary of this in the paper, but I didn't go into anywhere near as much detail as Roth. And um, the other question is, we have this upper bound, this asymptotic. What about a lower bound? Um, Behrend, in 1946, so this was before Roth even proved Roth's theorem. He actually um, gave a really nice construction for a lower bound on this a of x. So n to the power minus 2 root 2 log 2 plus epsilon over root log n. Um, it looks nasty here, but the construction's really, really nice. <laughs> so it gives this slightly ugly bound, but it's a, a really nice uh, yeah, proof. He actually constructs a set? Yeah, it's a, it's a straight construction, pretty simple. He constructs the set, proves that it avoids 3 term mathematical progressions. This has been improved. Um, it's been improved quite a bit, um, including Professor Wolf from, from the math department here. She uh, gave a paper with uh, Timothy Gauss, which improves this band. But, um, but this is a really nice paper. This is even shorter than any of the papers we've mentioned so far. This is like two pages, if that. Um, and none of the other lower bounds are quite as kind of neat. So that's why I mentioned their end. And I mentioned earlier about Ross theorem being like a gateway into, into some other results. So we can generalize Ross theorem. Um, the obvious generalization, I guess, is Samaretti's theorem. So Samaretti's theorem is the same idea as Ross theorem, but instead of looking at three time arithmetic progressions, we look at k time arithmetic progressions. Samaretti gave a proof of this um, using a different method to Roth. So Roth, I should probably talk about what Roth's method is. <laughs> that probably is. So Roth proves Roth's theorem using um, what some people refer to as like a density increment argument. Um, he uses the Hardy-Littlewood method. And Samaretti proved his theorem using a completely different method. Um, Timothy Gowers then proved Samaretti's theorem. Um, he proved it back in the late 90s, I believe using a generalization of Roth method. And um, I work through, he gives two papers, um, Timothy Gowers, for the Samaritis theorem. He gives a paper for k equals 4, so looking at 4 term arithmetic progressions, and then gives the next paper, which is a general k term arithmetic progression. And the 4 term arithmetic progression was 30 pages long and was pretty complex and I didn't understand every part and I'm not going to claim that I did. 
Um, his Cato Arithmetic Progression paper is about 120 pages, and I read the kind of introduction, and I felt satisfied that I had read the introduction, and I'm not any time soon going to kind of go through the whole proof. Um, but this was the kind of first generalization of Ross theorem. We can also um, look at subsets of the integers. So all of this is to do with arithmetic progressions in the integers. What about if we restrict ourselves just to prime numbers? So we look for three-term arithmetic progressions and prime numbers. Um, Green proved um, in a really quite nice paper that in the prime numbers, Roth theorem holds. So we have that the density, I suppose a, a way to reset Ross theorem is that you can't have too large a subset in the integers that avoids three-term arithmetic progressions. Um, so Green proved that the same thing holds for the prime numbers. That if you have a set of positive upper density, so what does that mean? That means that um, effectively it's got a non-trivial density within the whole of the prime numbers. Um, you can define it using a limit of the intersection between the interval of 1 up to n, um, the, the limit of the intersection between a set and the interval 1 over n has um, a strictly positive limit. That's positive upper density. Um, Green effectively showed that this holds for prime numbers. He then proved with tau, the Green tau theorem, which says that Samoretti also holds for the prime numbers. And this was a, a massive breakthrough in, in arithmetic combinatorics. It was proven in 2004. Um, Tau received the Fields Medal in 2006. And I've got no doubt that this was quite a kind of strong factor in his, in his getting award in the, uh, the Fields Medal. And it, it really was kind of amazing that they did this. What this actually gives a good step towards is a conjecture by Erdős and Trent. Yes? Sorry, you say hold for just the prime numbers, meaning that... Me, sorry, so meaning that Samoretti's theorem, which is that um, in one statement that you have arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions in the integers, that holds for if you restrict yourself just to looking at the prime numbers. So the green tau theorem states that for the prime numbers, you always have arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. So if you want to find a length 10 arithmetic progression, as long as you go far enough along in the prime numbers, there will exist such an arithmetic progression. It's okay. a given difference, is it? Pardon? No. You can always take m factorial plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, plus 4. No, I'm sorry, I'm thinking nothing else. <laughs> okay. So, sorry, I'll uh, slow it down a little. Then that's composite. Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, so this is, so in, in the prime numbers, it's saying, saying that if you just look at prime numbers and you want a length 10 arithmetic progression, okay. then you can find a number, and they give a specific asymptotic in the paper, that if you go up to that amount of prime numbers, then there has to exist somewhere in that 10 term arithmetic progression. So the edis turan conjecture is actually that if the reciprocal sum diverges, then sum really holds. So what do I mean by reciprocal sum? If you have a set M, and we'll just restrict to the natural numbers. So if we have a subset of the natural numbers such that The sum of 1 over m for m and m diverges, so this tends to infinity. Then Edis and Turan conjectured that if this condition holds, then sum already holds. So you have arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. And in actual fact, um, Edis offered $3,000 for a proof of this, which was one of the largest sums that he ever set for his problems. He was famous for offering cash prizes for, for proofs. And as far as I know, there's only two um, problems that he gave higher um, rewards for. One was for a tight asymptotic on A of X. Um, he offered $10,000 for that, which uh, is, is a pretty big sum. <laughs> um, 
And he also offered $10,000 for something to do with, I couldn't, I couldn't find an exact statement, something to do with gaps between prime numbers. Um, but yeah, barring those two, this is one of the largest numbers that Edis um, offered. And if you prove this, I'm sure somebody would, uh, <laughs> would give you the $3,000, but I think more importantly, you would pretty much cement your name in, in modern day mathematics. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, the prime numbers, um, it's fairly well known that the, the sum of the reciprocal of the primes diverges. So the green tire theorem definitely supports the Edis Tran conjecture, but as far as I can tell, we're still way off anybody being even remotely near a proof of the Edis Tran conjecture. It may be easier to find a context up. Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe if we just set all the computers working, we can, uh, we can find a counterexample. So that's a little bit about the kind of explanation side of my paper. But we're in an experimental math seminar. So I really, what I want to talk to you about was how I use experimental math in my project, and also a bit about interactivity, which is what I'm going to get onto in, in a moment. So I, the first thing I did when me and Dr. Z decided to look at Roth's theorem was I went to Maple. And I created a Maple package, which is just called roth.txt, and you can download it from my, um, from my website. And I created some procedures. And I wanted to really see what was going on with this theorem. I mean, we talk about this function a of x. So the first thing I did was I created a Maple package, a Maple, Maple program to calculate a of x. So to do that, um, I generated sets that avoided three-term arithmetic progressions. And I'll talk about it in a minute, but I did it by brute force, and I tried to improve it, and I did a bit by recursion, and it still was pretty computer intensive. I can't find an easy way to calculate AOX. Um, I also wanted to create procedures to help parts of the proof. So I mentioned earlier the Dirichlet box principle. So I created a procedure that you enter in an alpha and an m, and it calculates the Dirichlet box principle constants for you. So it calculates your rate, it calculates your q, it calculates your beta. Um, there's a string of obvious remarks that Roth does right at the start of his paper. He defines this capital A of x, and he defines little a of x to be this quantity a of x over x. So the size of the largest subset of 1 up to x avoiding 3 to half of progressions, and that's a of x, and its density is little a of x. And he states six obvious remarks, which are things like a of x plus y is less than or equal to a of x plus a of y. And he lists these six things and gives no proof whatsoever. So I use Maple to verify these empirically, and then from that, try and kind of get ideas for proofs. So I'll talk about that in a moment in the demonstration. But a of x is this all-important function. So I started to calculate it. And the first few terms are 1, 2, 2, 3, 4, 4, 4, 4, 5, 5, and so on. And I got to around about 25, and everything got really slow. And I was running it on the Maple servers that the department has. And I got an email one day from some professor saying, we're very sorry, but you've used up all the memory on the servers. Can you stop your program? <laughs> and I don't know quite how that happened. But at that point, I stopped. <laughs> and I did what experimental mathematicians do. And I consulted the online encyclopedia of integer sequences. Mm -hmm. So I plugged this into Sloan. And sure enough, there it was. It's uh, number 3002. And it's listed up to 77 terms. And that's it. And that's the most, as far as I know, that anybody's calculated to. And the 77th term, it gives a little thing about how it's calculated, and it was used using a few different computers, kind of really just throwing as much manpower towards it, or computer power, as they could. And in case you're interested, A of 77 is 22. I have no idea about any sets that exhibit that it's 22, but it is 22, according to Sloan. So I actually then went into Maple and used this to, to verify the theorem empirically. So we had this asymptotic, a of x over x is order 1 over log log x. So if we take a of x over x and multiply by log log x, 
then we should hopefully get that these terms are bounded by a constant. And sure enough, they were, and I'll give a demonstration in a moment. I also then wanted to make things a bit clearer for people who aren't that confident with Maple. So I created something called a maplet. And this is relatively new in Maple. I think it's been in the last three or four versions. And it's a bit more user friendly. It's got a graphic user interface, a GUI. So it's straightforward point and click. You don't need to know anything about Maple. Um, you just need to be able to use a keyboard and use a mouse, and, and it works. And I'll give a demonstration. The problem is really hard to create, <laughs> for one. Um, Maple syntax for these maplets aren't very easy whatsoever. Um, it's less powerful. I couldn't program all of my all of my procedures into this maplet without it taking hours upon hours upon hours. And you can't run it without Maple. Um, you need Maple installed on your computer to run these maplets. I tried to look at getting it to run on my website without a Maple, like a Java applet. And to do so, you have to pay Maple. Um, you have to pay Maple for them to host it on their servers, and then you can link to their servers and do it. And as much as I wanted this on my website, I didn't want it enough to pay MapleSoft mm -hmm. a decent amount of money to host it. Um, they have, however, in their latest, so Maple 15 was released last week. And although I haven't used it, I was looking at the, the new features. And it does seem that they've really improved the creation of maplets. And you can now drag and drop. It's a lot easier to create these things. So maybe in the future, they'll be a bit more useful. But I wanted to give you a demonstration of, of what I did. So let me just this. OK. So all of this is available on my website. You get the roth.txt file, and you run it. And it comes up with a little bit of an introduction. And this is just a list of the different procedures that I created. So I created quite a lot to kind of try and make sense of what was going on in this proof. And it really helped me to then explain and prove these things by hand. Kind of when I was programming these things, I was I was having to understand what was going on to be able to write the programs, which then helped me to, to write the explanations. But to give you a demonstration, um, I said before I created this program A of X. So you run A and plug in a number, and it gives you the size of the largest subsets that avoids three time arithmetic progressions. And it does this by generating all subsets that avoid three time arithmetic progressions. So if you run good subsets of eight, this is all subsets of one up to eight that avoid three time arithmetic progressions. So you take four, five, seven, eight, you pick any three elements that they're all in um, non arithmetic progression. And if you just want one set that avoids three term arithmetic regression, if you run sample A set, you get a subset of the integers 1 up to x of maximal size that avoids 3 term arithmetic regression. And I then cheated a little, and I used the data that was on Sloan and created a procedure called Sloan A, which gives, just refers to this list of numbers and gives you the data. So Sloan of 7 is 22. So I have trusted that the online encyclopedia of integer sequences is correct, but I think that's a fair assumption to make. Sorry. Is yep. the sample set generator a random? And the sample set is the first one in the algorithm that it creates. Um, I guess it would be pretty easy to run the good subsets, but it was quicker to generate the first one and just stop. Um, I mentioned before about checking the theorem empirically. So for the first 20, um, elements in, the, in this sequence, I calculated this a of x over x multiplied by log log x, and sure enough, they were all bounded by a constant. In fact, they were all bounded by around about 0 .0, uh, 0 0.55, which suggested... So log log x is so slow, I mean... Mm. I mean, it... it, it hey, certainly for the range you're considering. Yeah. That, um, it's not clear to me that, yeah, you know, empirically, yeah, I think it's not evident. Yeah, no, this, this isn't 
kind of yeah, ground breaking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is just kind of a demonstration of what could be used for intensive yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so similarly, you can graph, and like you say, it's nothing particularly enlightening. It's just a decrease in Now, if you could extend that to 100 million. <laughs> if we could calculate here to 100 million, I, I definitely would. But this is the only data that we have, so this is the only data I can use. Um, but some of the other functions I created were these functions to explain parts of the proof. So.